I entered the profession against my will and I said it is a parasitic profession and all that. But you know the legend of the profession is something which is fascinating. You know you hear of great trials, a great cross-examination, great lawyers. You know it's a dream, it's your dream to fight for liberty. It's such a fascinating, very romantic subject. But then I never thought that uh, my boon will be granted with such plenty. Welcome to the KG Kannabiran Lectures on Law, Justice and Human Rights. It is now a decade since Kannabiran passed on. He was a man, take him all in all. I shall not look upon his like again. It was Hamlet. Kannabiran was a self-taught and self-made man in a profession where godfathers and family and class meant everything. He rose from humble beginnings to legendary heights through sheer dedication and hard work. A prolific reader, he devoured every piece of literature that came his way as he struggled through school, college and practice. It was precisely that reading which expanded his mind. What forged him into a legend was a sensitive and brilliant defense of political dissidents and revolutionaries who were hunted down by the state during the emergency. He converted the courtroom into a literary convention, often asking his clients to recite poetry or explain the philosophy for which they were charged to the judge. He prided himself on his radical interpretation of the law, often educating the judges before whom he appeared to interpret the spirit and intent of the constitution. He was admired and loved for his fearless defense of causes, coupled with a deep tenderness for his poorer clients, which made him a much loved figure in Andhra Pradesh. He inspired many young lawyers searching for some meaning and radical dimensions in the practice of law. As president of the Andhra Pradesh Civil Liberties Committee and the People's Union of Civil Liberties, he was critical to expanding these movements to powerful institutions of human rights defense. He was involved in human rights work across the country which was idolized and adored particularly in his home state, Andhra Pradesh, by the poor and disempowered and often resented by rich and powerful people unless they had a case or a cause they needed him to fight. It is now a decade since his death and given the state of human rights today, his presence is sorely missed. This is an effort to preserve his heritage for the bright young lawyers who are emerging today, a generation that he sincerely believed would restore decency, dignity and justice to our country. Thank you. The family of K.G. Kandabiran welcomes you to the K.G. Kandabiran lectures on law, justice and human rights. Ten years after his death, we remember his spirit, his resistance and his constitutional insurgencies in courts and through courts and tribunals, in defense of dissent, personal liberty, associational freedoms and justice, speaking truth to power, calling for judicial accountability and state accountability, especially in the matter of repressive laws, custodial violence and extrajudicial murders, encounter killings, calling out entrenched practices of discrimination and structural violence, and setting out the basic structures of constitutional rule. We bring together a few of the lawyers and judges who knew him personally and worked with him on cases, campaigns and tribunals to remember their collaborations with him and reflect on future pathways of this important slice of the history of lawyering for human rights and civil liberties, rooted in the Indian experience. K.G. Kanabiran lived and worked in Andhra Pradesh in Hyderabad. He travelled across the country, appearing in courts of trial and high courts and in people's tribunals and fact-finding missions, 
from Kashmir, Assam and Manipur to Tamil Nadu, Chhattisgarh to Gujarat to Punjab, Karnataka and beyond. Within Andhra, every nook and corner, every forest and town bear his footprints. Practically every court in every jurisdiction in the state bears his imprint. Every university, meeting hall, meeting ground has heard him speak untiringly on the meanings of the rule of law and the constitution. No place was out of bounds in his quest for justice. We hope to remember him through the futures of his work and through the work of those who carry it forward in so many different ways. In this specific segment of lectures, we bring together the voices of those who shared his calling. Professor Upendra Bakshi is Emeritus Professor of Law, University of Warwick and Delhi and former Vice Chancellor, South Gujarat University and University of Delhi. He has been Director's Guest Fellow at the Nantes University Institute of Advanced Studies and a Senior Fellow at the Institute of Lawyers Culture at the University of Bonn. His works include Liberty and Corruption, The Antale Case and Beyond and Human Rights in a Post-Human World, Critical Essays. Professor Bakshi has also contributed to the Oxford Encyclopedia of Human Rights, the International Library of Essays in Law and Legal Theory, and the Routledge Handbook on Human Rights, among others. He is a prolific scholar, teacher, and mentor whose enormous corpus it is impossible to narrate here. Upendra Bakshi's work opens out infinite possibilities for a sustained investigation of the social and sociological embeddedness of law. Dear friends, I am very happy to be here. I owe my presence today to my affection for the Canabian family, of which I consider myself a small part, and my affection for Kana, Vasant, and Kalpana, and Avramya as well, is, uh, and, his, and her sister, is abounding. I did not know Kana as well, I'm obviously, as well as it Vasant and Kalpana. But we are all obliged to Vasant for providing us with a rare glimpse of Kana as a human being and as a partner and as a family person. And to use the, the Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard, Phrase. His phrase was fear and trembling. And we have seen moments of fear and trembling, not in, a, in the strict metaphysical sense of Kierkegaard, but we have seen a, a sense of apprehension at times in Kana's life, thanks to her memoirs. So I'm very grateful to all, the, all of them for giving me this opportunity to pay my very adoring, affectionate tribute to Kana as we all knew him. And in many senses, he's still with us. He, and we need him. He braved the state and non-state actors. And what is more, he also braved with rare courage and distinction the Lumpen proletariat, who thought they could do anything, they had a great sense of impunity. And the Lumpen element gave all of, us, all of us a few moments of anxiety, as they do now. Because the Lumpen elements, as I define them, have no sense of civilization, which only a decent regard for rule of law can bring, a civilized rule of law can bring. And Kana was a great critic of rule of law, but he was also uh, not guilty of throwing, the, throwing out the baby with the bathwater. In other words, he had a great faith in law as an agent of social redistribution and social change. And that made him very distinctive 
become less of the brethren of in his profession because he always regarded law as law plus and that plus was very vital in his thinking and that was social plus was social justice and that that the, that the configuration of Canada that I wish to talk about very briefly. First thing I would like to say is that Canada left a very wide footprint. And it was a, not a, what we today know as carbon footprint or ecological footprint. But his footprints on law and life were rather, to borrow a very luminous phrase of Rajni Kotarin, the, one of the founders of the UCL with Kana. To borrow its phrase, it was a footstep into the future that he led out of. And uh, that is still relevant and living contribution of his life to us. I originally, I thought of many ways of approaching him. Obviously, I'm not qualified too well or at, at all to speak about him as a practicing lawyer. But I'm aware of the many contributions he made to the practice and the profession of law. I'm so glad that Kalpana has covered and invited so many of his colleagues to contribute reminiscences of him at the bar. And although he was not on the bench, the way he tried to reform the bench from the bar is very notable. So there, there is that valuable legacy that has been examined by people who knew him as a practicing lawyer. And I thought of ambitiously, as it turns out, to talk about the jurisprudence of Kanabiran. And as I research more into it, I think it, that theme itself deserves a volume by its, in itself because it's a, I spoke about push step into future. It speaks to many things and many issues and many ideas at large, which are impossible to cover in, in the text or oral presentation of one lecture. It is subject by itself. Therefore, I took, I neither talk of, about him as a professional lawyer too much, although I'll come to some aspects of his practice of law, as I knew, knew them. Nor will I talk about uh, his theories of law and justice, which uh, I, I sense he had plenty to tell us about that. But I speak about uh, rather his praxis, how we uh, engage with the law as an affectionate enterprise to inject a minimum sense of constitutional morality among the bench and the bar and the people. And even that theme I cannot exhaust, I can only outline here. So there are very severe limitations of time and talent that I'm working with in addressing Kana's many splendid legacy and requests. The first thing I want to say that he may sound negative, but it's not negative in intent, and it should not be in effect. That is to say, Kanna was not a Hofeldian thinker. Hofeld died very young. He was a teacher at Yale University in 1920. But I've always regarded him, and he wrote, on, he unpacked the common law notion of rights. And he said rights are dual relations and they're a framework of dual opposites. They hunt together and they fall apart as it were. The relations are complementary as well as antagonistic. And I taught hope all my life as an entry point to law. Many of my students still remember that hope passes and remember Hoffit's thought. Kana did not exactly talk about impunity, which is my subject today. 
in the sense in which Hofer used it. The Hofer used it as one of the aspects of right, like power, right, disability, power, right, privilege, power, and immunity. The last sense of right was immunity. In the eight and the corresponding four relations, he talked about eight dual relations. Immunity came the last. Impunity came the last, sorry, and impunity meant the kind of a power or a right to remain untouched by law, like sovereign impunity, immunity, impunity. And a corresponding <coughs> excuse me, disability on the part of the subject of that impunity corresponding disability to exercise any anything approaching right. So loosely speaking, Kana was not a Hofeidian thinker, but he was a thinker all right. And he used impunity in a wider sense, which you ought to understand. He went further than Hofer in some senses, in his praxis as well as in theory. He used impunity as the power in some people to be above the law and above the claims of justice, above the claims of moral responsibility. So impunity, let us say, is a kind of a power which has gone berserk. And the masters of the power, wielding the power, uh, are not best addressed in terms of accountability or responsibility. So that's a language they don't understand. And Kanao is deeply concerned with this lack of understanding by holders of impunity. And Kanao was very careful in this, in, in this respect because he seemed to say, that both the state actors as well as non-state actors can claim impunity from law. That, I think, was some of his abiding contribution. He worked with non-state actors at several, and in his opinion, and quite rightly so, non-state actors came in various shapes. If you were with us today, he would have called the so-called, the properly so-called geopolitical terrorists as holders of impunity, but they're non-state actors. Uh, and what, who constitutes people who exercise impunity above law? It's a very good question. And here some ready-made answers. He did not say all those who disobey the state law peacefully. And peace was very important. Non-violence was very important for Kana. Those who resisted the law in the name of morality or justice were not exercising any impunity. It is those who place themselves the claims of law and justice about, about on, on themselves, the play, who denied any claims of justice and law. These people were enjoying impunity from law and justice. And it is these people that the impunity that he combated in his thought and professional action. And that, I think, again, is a great legacy in his, of his uh, profession practice and his thinking practices of thought. He always men mentioned that. Um, let us de-romanticize violent social insurrection. He always thought that we must de-romanticize violence and de-romanticize the armed struggle. But he also said that we should look at the underlying justice of the cause. We should look at the phenomenon of social protest. 
because it has certain coded messages for the social structure from which it arises. And therefore, he took a complex position on impunity. What the state calls the impunity is of the disobedient people is a device of convenience, a device of power. For Kanna, that was wrong. Calls for accountability, but in themselves, by themselves, considered at the threshold just by him. And that, but why did they were peaceful? And there's a whole history of his, uh, uh, the way he was involved, he was conscripted, he was requested, he was harnessed, whatever word you want to use by the state to negotiate with the so-called radical extremists, Anza and elsewhere, shows that he managed to convince them of the way it's important, importance of waging non-violence. Protest must be non-violent in his, in his um, book. And therefore, although he was a Hopelian thinker, I think he concentrated very well on an aspect of power that matters the most to me and to every lawyer in the country, which is impunity. And the greatest possible, possibly the greatest contribution of Kana in his time, even now, is to ask lawyers to be a constant pages of war against impunity. Impunity for him equal injustice in society. The employers as a profession and judges as a profession and legal economists as a profession are against injustice. They are by definition again must be against impunity, which resists all claims of law and justice. So whether by state actors or non state actors. In fact, he was the call to resist the epidemic of impunity. Impunity was a performative act of power. And he said somewhere, he said, impunity is to be resisted, especially in, a, and I quote him, in a world where all governments are bent upon comparing Hitler and Mussolini to small time operators. The extent of injustice, according to him, was very great in every society, but he looked at Indian society and he found it unbearable. Milan Kunda has a very wonderful book called The Unbearable Likeness of Being. And feminists have made a uh, very nice to use all this phrase, but that will take me too far to go. So I won't go far afield, so I won't go there. I'll just mention it. Impunity, which mocks at law and justice, should occupy the foreground of juristic thought and action. It's the mantra that Kanna has given to us. So, in my second point is, Concerns why he invaded so much against impunity. First, because he believed that it led to work which appeared rather late for him to study. And the work was entitled uh, Democide. And subtitle Death by governments. The work was produced by a sociologist called Ramel, and Ramel's book has been unjustly ignored. And Ramel demonstrated the exercise of lethal sovereignty. Sovereignty, which is by itself was lethal, it killed people, it tortured people. And can I always believe this was not civilized governments. And lawyers and judges and everybody, everything in the citizen must fight against it. 
The other part of impunity that concerned him was the Siamese twin of democide. The Siamese twin was what I call, and it would have readily agreed, but I call it now, systematic governance corruption, SGC. So democide and SGC were the ways in which impunity manifested itself in everyday life. And the third aspect of impunity, third aspect of this performance of impunity arose from what, it, what I call nihilism, constitutional nihilism. That is nihilism as a good old thinker Frederick Nietzsche once said uh, several, in several of his books, but his it's a kernel of his thesis of Nietzsche was activism can be of two types. One is what he called active nihilism, and other is what he called passive nihilism. Active nihilism was um, a, a process of transvaluation of basic values. Passive nihilism, in his view, passive nihilism was trans transvaluation of all values, and active nihilism was reinstallation of new values in its place. So nihilism was a two-sided process. And Kana always fought this kind of constitutional nihilism. As an aspect of democide, as an aspect of systematic governance corruption, and as an aspect of impunity. Can I also thought of this term, this concept was not available, current in his time, of what Richard Albert, Professor Albert, has sufficiently called this constitutional dismemberment. Albert uh, uh, distinguished between constitutional amendment and constitutional dismemberment. What it mean? He meant very much what Carl Smith earlier said. Carl Smith said there are two kinds of things you can do to the constitution. One is called communist Soviet dictatorship, and second he called the sovereign dictatorship. Now, what did he mean? By communist Soviet dictatorship, he meant bettering the constitution, improving the constitution to make it work better than before, but within the constitution. Constitution remains, but the amendments are made to work it better. Its aims and goals and values are served better by amendments. And we have plenty of amendments on gender justice, uh, on backward classes, on Bahujans and Dalit Samaj, which are giving them certain benefit, certain representation, certain voice, certain identity. Now we've got Nauta Johar and we've got uh, gender rights given, and we've got uh, sexual minorities' rights and so on. So we have plenty of judicially invented rights. They are meant to amendments of the constitution. They are not for an amendment, but they are virtually judicially admitted rights. But I'm not going there. Judic legislative amendments to the constitution, which aim to work, the aim to seek better fulfillment of constitutional promises. And Kanna regarded many of the amendments which to the constitution and not be valid but as good, which serve the purpose of distributive justice, land reforms, agrarian reforms, and he was solely against the right to property. He did not consider this amendment marks of authoritarianism or despotism. He considered as acts of, in, in uh, Smith's words, acts of commissary dictatorship. As against commissar dictatorship, there is the Smith to the 
at our attention to what is called people's sovereign dictatorship, which meant, in simple words, a people like Brexit decide to go out of a pact, firm pact with other nations through a process of referendum, which means the change of the constitution, not change in the constitution. There are two different concepts. So, Kana did, on the one side, he, he can be said to have disapproved the change of the constitution, but not progressive changes in the constitution. I noticed a kind of uh, democratic ambivalence in Kanna here. I call it a healthy democratic ambivalence. There can be unhealthy democratic ambivalence. I believe Kanna showed healthy democratic ambivalence. On the one side, he privileged the, the uh, distributive aspects redistributive aspects like land reforms and all amendments directed the right to property as commis acts of commissary dictatorship. They're justified. They're not dis they were amendments proper. They're not dismemberment of the constitution. On the other side, he, he developed the thesis uh, that is in his book, Wages of uh, Trinity, excellent book, if you're not ready. And he privileged, in the other side, the integrity of right structures and belief and faith in judicial review powers. So, in a sense, Kanna finds very ironical, and I quote him, that why the right to liberty registering victories in court, restraints on personal liberty and the approval of the court. He found an ambivalent moment, not so much in his thought, but in judicial performance itself, in the period of till 80s or early 90s that he was concerned with. In fact, you would find he bones the period of ages and earlier periods as, um, if I got it right, as a period of authoritarianism and totalitarianism. So these words are used with great responsibility much earlier in terms of absolute majority in parliament. And of course, he didn't have the concept of democratic recession at that time in his mind. The concept was not put in this course, it's a recent term. Democratic recession occurs um, when there is a significant erosion in electoral fairness. When the space for political and civic dissent and opposition shrinks. When the executive is bent upon entrenching his personal powers and entrenching ruling party hegemony. This is what the experts in political science tell us. You think democratic recession is a concept in the three senses. They tell us that there has been declining tendency towards declining freedom throughout the world. We may fix the parameters. They have quantitative study, quantitatively studied the decline in freedom. And Kana perceived the acuity of Kana lies in pursuing this democratic recession, as it is now called, as early as 80s or as early as 70s in India. I leave that subject and come to my 
at winding up remarks, which I have given somewhat long, but with that I will rest my statement. Kanna also as a I want to indicate barely and then move on on this aspect. If Kanna was an activist lawyer, but his was not an astroturf activism, superstructural activism. His was a grassroots activism. And that's a very important distinction when we study legal, legal professional activism. One can be activists fighting for justice for corporations and big business. Kanna fought for constitutional have nots. So it's a difference, not merely of clientele, but different of social vision. They do not necessarily become operate legal professional sellers, so it's a seller's market. But you operate legal profession for constitutional purposes and for justice. To use my own expression, uh, he, he, he roughly said what I try to say in a different way. I say good lawyers are those who are not shoulders of states and corporations. Shoulders. Give shoulders, support. But are soldiers for constitutional justice. It's everybody's choice, of course, everybody's free to exercise one choice. But when one give, chooses the former, one has a stake in established present order. One gives way to change in social order when one is espousing their conception, the lesser conception, the conception of soldiers of justice. So he thought of law as the soldiers of constitutional justice, not as shoulders of the state of cooperation. I think the legendary uh, life that he lived of dedication to the constitutional have not. He also he demonstrated in the book Wages, he said the, the constitution had produced a crop of lawyers who, and I, these are words, who, these are his words, who halted or stalled the progress of the country towards this constitutional goal right from the beginning. These are his words. And these are, I believe, true. No litigation provided so much prosperity to a class beholder to it as land reform. If you just look at the Supreme Court cases and lawyers that appear for the landowners compared with lawyers who appear to be landless, you will hear this story. You don't, if you are ratio artists, you will miss the social profile of litigation. But Kana always bore in mind the social profile of litigants and litigation, the causes of justice which they fought against or for. He even said, while the legal profession appeared as a champion of rights, it also appeared as a champion of wealth owning classes. And it not even, uh, even, uh, even spare uh, a man like Dr. Ambedkar, who appeared after he left the government of India in 1954 or so thereabout against the government, against the constitution that is drafted in a land right property case by Big Jaminda. And therefore this crop of lawyers, the idea that uh, um, just as the Vedi said in Keshwanda Bharti, he said the constitution is not meant for small men with big purses but it's meant for doing social justice to people and that's a document to be revered. That feeling Kana had in, uh, before Keshwana was, long before Keshwana was delivered and all his life. I would now end by the last observation. So we are gone for too long. The last set of observations 
concern. Kana is a lawyer who have all his life asked for something. He asked for a decent and civilized system of law. And he asked for the voice of the voices to be heard and protected. Therefore, I did have great comfort when the Human Rights Commission, National, National Human Rights Commission, asked me to write an essay recently for the Human Rights Journal on Human Rights, it was released on this Human Rights Day. I wrote something about criminal law administration of justice. Krishna I had Justice Krishna I used to say, some of you know, as a judge, he spoke about immediate distinction between criminal administration of justice and administration of criminal justice. I won't go into that just now. Krishna had a in 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 imitable style of putting things. But what Kanna was saying, what Krishna was saying, and right, I tried to add some footnote in this article, was that we don't have a criminal justice system. What we have, what we have is administration of criminal justice. What Indian people have a right as a democratic nation living under the constitution, is a right to criminal justice system. And I believe Karna, without using this kind of pretheology, did believe in this unstated, unenunciated right, which I am now there to enunciate in the National Human Rights Quarter yearly, just published. I said Indian people have a right to criminal justice system. I take a minute or two and then I learn. What does this mean? What does criminal justice system mean? One, a series of general postulates of criminal justice. And I've listed 10 of them. I won't take your time with it. You can read my article. I'll be grateful. But essentially, general postulate will consist on idea, simple idea. Very simple idea is that you do not shoot suspect at sight. Criminal law is not an engine of oppression or repression or liberation. Criminal law is meant to preserve an order in society, which order, however, is according to the constitution and is just, not for vendetta, not for personal use, not for aggrandizement, not to bully or threaten people. It is only there to maintain social order, collective right, human right to social order, peaceful social order. Similarly, the way I did, I used to do criminology in Delhi University and I used to tell us the students what is the science, what is the summary of criminology, what does criminology say? And with great difficulty, I made them understand a simple idea. And simple ideas are most difficult. I said criminology only says one thing, that is, one is sent to jail as punishment and not for punishment. It's not quibbling with words at all. As punishment, punishment means deprivation of people's, a person's freedom to move throughout the territory of India with the constitution of India against. That's all. Punishment doesn't mean there will be sodomized in the air. There are no medical facilities. My coat will be rotten. There are no clothes to wear. No blankets to winter. Money is not sent for punishment in jail in a civilized society. So like that, I developed 10 ideas of a simple, simple idea. Everybody will agree of the idea of criminal justice society. I think people have a right to general postulates of a decent society in the field of criminal and administration of criminal justice. And we have to move from the present 
system of admission of criminal justice to a criminal justice system. Present chaos, today we don't know what makes a system a system. Our body is a series of system, endocrine system, respiratory system, expiratory system, uh, respiratory system, heart, and each system and digestive system and so systems and systems provide interact with each other. Our judges do not have lawyers to know how many how many beds there are in a hospital in a, in a prison. Our judges when they sentence somebody or deny bail do not know the people are packed like sardines into the jail. They have far exceeded the jail capacity of inmates. And you can get number of them. A system is one thing where it interacts with various subsystems of you. And we act all as prosecution works in one way, the enforcement works, investigation works in another way, judicial culture works in third way, and there is no interaction among them. The systemic interaction between the various systems is essential to criminal justice system. I think Kana anticipated some of these things. So, towards the quick end of a long winding presentation, Kana, I missed you today, and all of us missed you today, and we salute for what you stood for and what you have done for Indian legal system in your lifetime. Thank you.